So as um, Chris said, that I've, I've actually got multiple roles um, that I've got, wear multiple hats. I actually got involved in nanomedicine about eight years ago and hopefully throughout my presentation you'll get a sense as to why I did. Um, having been a, a cancer researcher now for 20 years, well actually over 20 years, um, it gave me the opportunity to approach the disease I was working on um, in a very different way. Now, nanomedicine means a lot of things. So if you go on the web and you look up what nanomedicine is, you'll, you'll find a range of definitions uh, of, of what it is. Um, I really got interested in, um, I guess, the whole concept of nanomedicine when I saw uh, this movie. I don't know if any... Can you give me an indication if any of you have seen this movie, Fantastic Voyage? Well, yeah, the, all the oldies are probably putting their hands up, but, you know, it's, it's from 1967, and... It was actually, yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> there were people born in 1967. Um, but it, it was actually a very interesting uh, movie. It was about a, a diplomat which, who was um, nearly assassinated. But, but what they did in order to save him, they had to shrink him and they put him into a human body. But, you know, then there's this whole um, battle in the human body where they all miniaturise themselves and they start circulating in the bloodstream. And it's actually, if you haven't seen the movie, it's actually worth seeing if you can get hold of it because it, it's quite fascinating because some of the things they had to contend with like you know immune cells trying to swallow the submarine and um, you know are they, you know getting clogged up in in uh, blocked blood vessels I mean they're quite relevant today to disease states so um, but it is very science fictiony but it, it's actually always good to look at that because you know people imagine these things a very very long time ago that we could develop nano uh, medicines, nano devices um, to treat diseases. So, although people have had the idea for a long time, we're starting to see it realised in a big way now. So, you're living in a, in a great era. So, um, well, you've seen a lot of talks about nano. Um, different people um, define nano in different ways. So, I'm just going to uh, check my screen here. Give me a second. Yeah, different people define nano in different ways. Um, it really, it's, I guess it's, uh, it, you know, it's a unit of measurement, as you all know. Uh, it comes from the word nanos, which is a, a Greek word, which means dwarf, um, and which is sort of a, a very odd thing to call nano, but anyway. Um, but that, that's sort of the, the broad definition. And people use various scales, like if, if you go and look at uh, various publications, you'll see um, where people would refer to a nanostructure is between sort of uh, 10 to the, to the 6th and 10 to the 7th. Is that 10 to the 6th? Yep. I can't actually read it up here. Um, so 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th um, in, in that sort of range. And carbon nanotubes, which you may have heard of, they often get a lot of media attention, um, and viruses fall, fall within this range. But if you look at a red blood cells, which is usually about sort of, um, I think it's about 15 microns uh, across. You can see sort of the scale. Um, it's about a one thousandth the width of a human hair is, is a nano. That just gives, puts it in perspective, but it, like I said, when we're talking nanomedicine, uh, people do use very broad definitions. So I guess, you know, what is nanomedicine? I mean, we, we often get, you know, being a director of the Australian Centre for Nanomedicine, People say to me, well, exactly, okay, we, we sort of hear the term, but what is it? Um, I guess in the broadest term, it's actually um, where we can engineer and manufacture uh, materials really at, at this sort of nano scale. Um, and we can develop new things doing that, whether it's therapeutic devices, whether it's um, things for industry. Uh, I mean, we've had nanoparticles in paints for a very long time. Um, so it's the ability to actually put together uh, chemical entities and create something new at that sort of very nano scale. Some people even define nano up to one micrometer as well. Now, for many years, um, I guess nanotechnology and, and nanomedicine was in the realm um, of, of sort of chemists and, um, and engineers because they were the ones who were working on these things. They were creating them, getting a whole heap of publications and at some point thinking, oh, we could probably apply this somewhere. But it really wasn't um, until, I guess, uh, they started thinking about this a bit further, getting involved with physicists um, and biologists and, and doctors 
to start thinking, look, we can really apply this technology and do something with it for therapeutic value. Because like I said, I think the industry for nanotechnology in terms of the industrial sense has been around and more advanced for a long time. But in terms of nanomedicine, it is relatively new. Um, and when I say relatively new, we're probably talking the last sort of 10, 15 years uh, where it's really ramped up. Um, and so in, in terms of this sort of happening, this is actually was the philosophy of us setting up the nanomedicine centre. Rather than starting from where it usually starts with chemistry and engineering, we actually identify the medical problems now and then we go to the chemists and the engineers and we talk to them about how they can structure something for our needs. Because in the past it's worked the other way around. They've created something that looks really exciting and then we're trying to get it to fit into a medical sense which is always a bigger challenge. But starting off with the actual problem first, the clinical problem, and then working up what you need to um, create, it, we're finding is actually advancing our research a lot more. So um, these structures, these, these uh, chemical entities that can be created can be really diverse structures. And, and really, I've only shown you uh, just a snippet of some of the structures that you can actually um, create. Um, you know, liposomes, um, these are extensively used and probably the most uh, extensively used clinically for drug delivery, um, where you, you've got these lipophilic structures on the outside and a core where you can um, encapsulate drug. And I'll be talking more about these things, uh, my cells, uh, carbon nanotubes, um, a whole lot of structures. You literally can create any shape you want. With, with poly between polymer chemistry and the materials, um, you know, you, you can create triangles, you can create squares, you can create cylinders, uh, I mean, you name it. And these can be, um, have, be cross-linked in such a way that you can incorporate either drugs or genetic material um, or genetic material to switch off genes within those structures. So it, it's really um, an enormous, uh, enormously versatile technology, but there's a lot we still need to learn with, about it and refine it. And the applications in terms of nanomedicine um, for this sort of technologies is in nanotherapeutics. So I've already mentioned that you know can encapsulate drugs and deliver uh, drugs, chemotherapy drugs. And the reason we, we want to do this, because many of you would know, is chemotherapy is very toxic. Um, and if we can find uh, better ways of delivering, and I'm going to be talking, I won't go through this too much now because I'm going to be expanding on these topics throughout my talk. Um, but you can um, you can actually uh, use these delivery agents. There's one in the in the clinic already. Uh, well, there's two drugs in the clinic for cancer therapy that are liposomal uh, nanoparticle formulations, um, and they've they've been quite successful. Um, and and so I think we're going to be seeing more and more of these type of agents uh, in the clinic. Now, also in nanodiagnostics, so, for example, particles that you can put a heavy metal, like gadolinium or iron oxide or uh, chromium, um, various metals you can put. And these are, this is also to increase the resolution of imaging. So, for example, um, MRI, you know, which you would have heard, magnetic resonance imaging, which we use a lot to look for uh, tissue damage, bone damage, cartilage damage. Um, again, we, we haven't reached the resolution of the instruments yet, like the, um, the high resolution, because our imaging agents are not there yet. So these type of nanoparticle delivery agents are increasing the scope and the resolution of those, um, those images. But, and I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more later about how we can actually even combine those with therapeutics as well. So that's where uh, nanotheragnostics comes in. Here you can, you can um, deliver... Um, not only image, but deliver drugs at the same time. Uh, with nanotherognostics, and this covers, a, again, a huge area. You may have heard some, I'm not sure if you heard any talks here about devices and, or anything like that. Um, but you can actually um, use combination of smart materials that not only can detect a disease, um, but can also deliver the therapy at that point as well, uh, where you want to treat the disease. Um, and this is all uh, fairly experimental, but it's moving, it's moving at a fairly rapid uh, pace. And you can also get um, smart surfaces, which is where you can actually um, get, develop your own um, diagnostic devices where you can have a layer of, of say, a, a polymer material 
And on top of that, you can put what we call a bioactive surface. So it may have linked with a peptide or a protein. Um, so it can interact uh, with proteins. So if you put uh, biological fluid like blood or serum or urine on that surface, you can detect if there's particular analytes, particular DNA uh, in, that, um, in that material. And with, with the idea of ultimately um, being able to detect how much of that is there, is it associated with disease state, but people are now taking that even one step further and developing these de devices that in the future, not only will you be able to detect the imbalance in the body, but maybe treat at the, you know, uh, at the same time. So, I mean, anyone who, you know, is a diabetic or knows a diabetic knows that they have to constantly monitoring their blood glucose levels, um, and they have to be injecting themselves with, um, insulin. I mean, ultimately, and I don't think this is far away, you know, we'll have devices that will monitor and be able to accurately adjust the insulin levels in the body so patients don't develop in the long term um, some of the long term side effects that are associated with uh, diseases like diabetes because of the way uh, they're being treated. So I want to also um, give cancer as an example of, I guess, a, a nanomedicine, the potential in cancer. It's probably one of the biggest areas in nanomedicine is cancer. And the reason for this is because, I mean, um, cancer is the number one killer from disease um, around the world. Um, a remarkable um, 7.6 million people a year die from cancer around the world. Um, and, you know, it's, so it is a, a major problem. Um, some of these can be uh, preventable, some of them can't. Um, lung cancer is actually accounts for 13% of all cancers and many of you know uh, smoking is a major cause. It's not the only cause but it's a major cause so 1.6 million people um, and, uh, and but it's, it's one of those diseases we can't really treat very well. So I'll be talking a little bit about our research. So I'm going to intermingle some of our own studies in the presentation as well as what's happening um, out there as well. So why do we need new treatments for cancer? I mean, you know, we hear on the news all the time that, you know, um, people are, are living longer, etc. cetera. Um, and it is true, survival rates have improved, um, but mainly because of earlier diagnosis. It's not because we've improved the therapies. So, for example, in, breast, in the case of breast cancer, early screening is picking up the disease early. If you can pick up the disease when, where it started and you can remove that tumour, the patient has a very good chance of long-term survival. If the tumour actually spreads to distant parts of the body, uh, like metastatic disease, um, it is much more difficult to treat because those tumour cells have undergone um, a number of genetic alterations, so it makes them highly resistant to the chemotherapy. So metastatic disease is considered relatively incurable um, at the moment. Um, the other issue is that patients can sometimes respond to therapy but then they actually develop resistance to the therapy. So, you know, when you get tumours, um, like a solid tumour particularly, is what we call a heterogeneous disease. In other words, not every cancer cell um, in that, in that tumour is a clone of itself. And, you know, one might have slightly different genetic alterations. So the reason you sometimes see that a patient responds well to therapy is because you treat that patient, most of the tumour cells are destroyed, but you have you know, a few little tumour cells that are actually uh, acquired genetic mutations that survive the treatment. Now, the patient seems to be doing well, six, nine months later, a year later, the tumour returns, doctors treat again with that same therapy, thinking, well, they've responded. Uh, more often than not, um, that patient will no longer respond to that therapy. And that's because what you've done is selected a population of cells that are highly resistant to the therapy. So we really do need better ways and improved ways to treat this highly resistant disease. The other thing is uh, to point out, and this is something that I'm very passionate about um, as someone who works in children's cancer research, is the toxicity of the treatments. So, so chemotherapy and even radiotherapy is highly toxic. Um, it, it's good and it's the best thing we've got at the moment and as a result a lot of people have survived their disease. But when it comes to children particularly, um, a lot of the kids that are survivors of childhood cancer um, can end up having long-term side effects from their treatment. 
Um, you guys probably haven't had time to be listening to the news, but the last week or so, there's been a big campaign to try and encourage people who are adults now and survivors of childhood cancer to go to long-term follow-up clinics. Because what often happens is that once they leave the children's hospital, um, they just go into the mainstream and people don't know how to treat them properly. But it, it is a major issue. And, um, and even for adults, it's, or they often have to stop treatment because of the toxic side effects of treatment. So I think, um, you know, I've finished off, we can do better. And I really do believe we can do better. And even, even with these uh, early drugs um, that I'll be talking about that are now in the clinic, we're already seeing reduced toxicity with those agents. And there's nothing really special about how that they're targeting a particular tumour or not. Um, they just have reduced toxicity. So in terms of um, nanoparticles in cancer therapy, um, you know, I mentioned we've got these two drugs, the drugs that have been encapsulated as nanoparticles. They've been around for a long time, been highly successful. Uh, paclitaxel, um, it, although it's a very successful drug, has two major problems in the clinic. Uh, one is that it's, it's highly lipophilic. It means it can't be dissolved easily in water and it, it gets dissolved um, in a solution called cremophore. Now, cremophore, unfortunately, causes immune reactions in some patients. So, so the patients have to be immunosuppressed sometimes, which is counterintuitive when you're talking cancer, um, but to, to tolerate the drug. The other problem with this drug is that it actually causes peripheral neuropathy, and that means your, your peripheral nerves, you know, your fingers, your toes, you know, and your extremities, um, it can actually, the nerves can actually get damaged. Uh, mostly it's reversible once you stop the treatment, but sometimes it's so severe they have to stop the treatment from the patients. This other drug, doxorubicin, again, a highly successful drug, causes cardiac toxicity. So this can be a major problem for someone who's younger. So I have one of my talented young scientists in my group is a, is a survivor of childhood cancer and um, has severe heart problems from being treated uh, with this drug. So he's living that with that. Uh, he's now in his late 30s and obviously he's thankful he's alive, but, you know, if we can do this better and it, it just as effectively, it would, it would be good. So these drugs have already been um, encapsulated in the clinic, but again, people are looking to improve them even better. Um, we can also um, deliver DNA, RNA or proteins to, um, to tumours using uh, nanotechnology, and I'll be expanding on these. Uh, I've already mentioned we can use them for imaging, so where we can localise tumours much better, localise metastatic spread. That's the other thing. When people are diagnosed, we can't always tell if their tumour has spread. Like with some of the new scanning technology, it's improved, but under a certain number of cells, that technology is not sensitive enough. So if we can pick up even small tumour masses at an early stage and treat them, that would be a great thing. And there's also these bio-devices, so we can pick up either um, you know, genetic variations in the blood or we can uh, pick up abnormal proteins in the blood that are associated with cancer, again, telling us whether the therapy is working, whether the disease is there, whether the disease is returned. Again, early detection is critical when you're talking cancer. Um, and then we can also uh, create drugs we have got controlled release because most of the chemotherapy drugs we use don't stay in the body very long. They, our renal system uh, clears them out fairly rapidly. But if we can trap these drugs at the tumour site and the drug can be released slowly, it will, it will work much more effectively. And then we can also add, to make it very specific, some of the targeting very specific, we can add antibodies onto the surface of the particles and so they can actually home to very specific cancer types. And this doesn't just apply to cancer, by the way. I mean, other diseases where this might be useful, um, where you want to home into a, a particular site. It's just, like I said, um, best studied um, in cancer. And, and the idea, what people are also trying to do is, is get these multifunctional nanoparticles where you can do a combination of these things just in the one particle. So that way you can, you can um, image, deliver drugs um, and detect uh, all, all at once. But there's, there's um, still a long way to go. We really, we still have to make, tailor make a lot of these systems. So if I work on one cancer, um, you know, one type of particle may work quite well, but it may not work so well in another cancer. That's something to keep in mind. Um, 
the, we, we do know and we're hoping uh, in the future we'll be able to significantly reduce the toxic side effects uh, of conventional drugs, but again, it depends on the particles. Uh, these are not without their, their side effects as well, um, but at the moment, at least in the two that are in the clinic, um, it does look like there's um, less side effects from the drug uh, that was, then was seen uh, with the, the drug that was not encapsulated in a particle. The other thing is, uh, is the imp improved drug solubility. So the reason um, the paclitaxel analogue, this uh, liposomal formulation that they made is uh, less toxic is because they don't have to dissolve it now in this cremophore that was causing the problems. What they've done is they've linked the drug up with albumin, which is very abundant in our serum, and a lipophilic formulation. So it forms this, this particle. So it's actually easier to deliver it without um, delivering the delivery agent. So that's actually reduced uh, toxicity already, although the peripheral neuropathy effects are still there. So I think in the future, being able to target that particle to specific cancer types rather than systemically delivering it um, could be a way to go. We, we do know that some of these particles have got prolonged circulation. Like I said, they don't get cleared out. But again, that's highly dependent on their size and their charge. There's no one magic formula that everything fits in together. And I've already mentioned these slow release formulations. Um, and the other thing is we can do with this type of technology is exploit the disease state. So if we know a particular disease um, has a, a particular genetic alteration, the surface of the, of the affected cells are altered, we can actually try and target those cells or target the pathology around that cell. And that's what I'm talking about with targeted delivery. So this is the, um, the, the two agents I was talking about, uh, the liposomal formulation of uh, Doxel, um, and the, uh, which is uh, donorubicin, um, and the albumin base. And these are both FDA approved in the US. They're also used in Australia. And Abraxane uh, was originally approved for um, uh, metas drug refractory metastatic breast cancer. They're now, for patients who don't tolerate Taxol, they're using it at what we call the first-line therapy. So those patients get given uh, right from the start. Um, and that's, that's looking very promising. And I, and I just saw some recent data um, at this conference, this ClinNAM conference I went in uh, Basel in, in Switzerland, um, where the person who d uh, actually invented this drug um, and developed this drug was showing some new data in pancreatic cancer now, pancreatic cancer is a bit of a complex disease in that you've got the cancer cells in the tumour, but then you've got a lot of what we call stromal cells, which are like fibroblast cells. And these are so-called normal cells. But these cells actually change when they get to the tumour site and they make the tumours highly resistant to therapy. So they almost like mop up the drug, but they don't die themselves and then the tumour cells still survive. So pancreatic cancer is probably is one of the... Um, really difficult to, like non-small cell lung cancer, one of the really difficult to treat cancers. Um, so what they discovered with this drug, and this is, this is a very new finding for the group, is that for some reason, this agent, this, um, uh, paclitaxel, this abraxane, is actually destroying the stromal cells. They don't quite know why yet, but that's, that's actually very exciting. So the net result is it's colla collapsing the structure that's supporting those cancer cells and the cancer cells are dying and tumours are shrinking. So, you know, sometimes even when you, you put a drug on the market, you don't know completely how it's going to work, you don't know completely how it's going to work uh, in different tumours, but that's a very exciting advance with, with that drug. But, you know, these formulations are not easy. So this liposomal formulation of Doxor hit the news last year uh, around the world because Doxor is used for um, metastatic breast cancer when uh, patients have failed all other treatment, and there was a worldwide shortage of the drug. And the worldwide shortage happened because the company upgraded their facilities because there was a great demand for the drug, and when they did that, they actually couldn't make it how they made it before. So there's a, because these are materials that we're working with, you know, even, even though they had everything prescribed exactly all the same solutions and everything. Um, it took them over six months to resolve the issues, to be able to make it. Now, this is something that's in the clinic uh, and people are using. So you can imagine it caused a lot of panic around the world 
about you know this shortage of, of supply and doctors had to make decisions about who got who didn't get uh, this formulation but when you're using this sort of technology the reproducibility and the variation in what you're producing is is really critical and the FDA will not normally approve a drug unless you show that it's a really uniform size and structure because you can imagine you can't just um, give a patient something that has got a mixture of things that are 50 nanometers 100 nanometers and 150 nanometers um, in size because how do you assess toxicity for something like that? So, um, it, look, this is on, it, I mean, it is on the market. It's still a good drug, but I'm just trying to um, indicate to you that some of these things, when you're, you're making these type of entities, it's not always straightforward. So I've already mentioned some of these things we can deliver, like the chemotherapy. We can um, deliver gene silencing technology, and I understand you've learned a little bit about microRNA and gene silencing um, around the place. So it's, it's genetically, uh, sorry, it's an evolutionary conserved mechanism of switching off genes. But the really great thing is we can exploit it um, in, in cancer therapy because we know some genes um, that are increased or turned on in a cancer cell are actually driving the growth of that gene. So in the laboratory, it's very easy for us to check this, see if we switch it off, does it stop the growth of the cells, does it um, make them more uh, responsive to chemotherapy, does it affect how the tumour will metastasize? We can do that in the laboratory. Now we're getting to that next level, we're able to start looking at delivering these things and there actually are clinical trials um, where over 2,000 patients have now been in clinical trials where they've delivered, for safety purposes, have delivered um, short hairpin RNA or siRNA um, to patients. And these trials are safety trials at this stage. They're not, they're not efficacy. So I don't know if you're aware, but a phase one trial, clinical trial, is where they check um, the toxicity levels of something you're giving a patient. Um, Phase two, they do a mixture of do what they call dose escalation. So they found the doses, they're just checking the range and they look for some effects for promising. By phase three trials, they're looking for what we call efficacy. So to make sure that it's actually uh, working properly. So there's a lot of steps to go through. But um, these are in clinical trial and we're keeping our fingers crossed that um, they will progress well. Um, now, you know, the particles are actually in clinical trial. I, I personally, and I know other people don't think are probably the best ones, but it's really just to get the proof of concept that we can do this. And there's a lot of effort around the world to develop better particles um, to deliver these, uh, these types of things. Um, and now in terms of some of the challenges uh, I talked, talked about, um, you know, these, again, chemical entities, if you're also attaching um, sort of RNA interference within those uh, systems, you need to make sure that the, your particles are stable. So you don't want to put them in the bloodstream and then suddenly, you know, they're, they're falling apart or they're too small and they get excreted or they're too big and they get trapped. Uh, these are all things that we need to take into consideration. Um, that's, and also the specificity, you know, the tissue penetration, uh, intracellular delivery, again, size, size is important here. Uh, but not just the size, but also the charge on the particles. Um, so, you know, if they're too, if they're too positively charged, they will cause toxicity. If they're too negative, they won't get taken up by the cells. So it's, it's just this balance. So there's a lot of work that goes on to, um, identify what these are. And then also we've got um, toxicity. Again, um, you know, you have to check toxicity. I mean, whether any drug or any therapeutic you deliver, you always have to do that. Um, the only thing is we don't know is, I guess, what the long-term effects of some of these things are going to be. Most of the things that we work on um, are what we call biodegradable. So they, they will break down and eventually be excreted in the body. Um, I don't know whether, you know, some of these heavy metals, how they would go. We'll, we'll have to uh, wait and see, but there's studies ongoing. Uh, the other thing that can happen with these particles is you can get immune stimulation. And I've actually said this can be uh, good and it can be bad. Um, the, if you get a little bit of immune stimulation, that's not so bad because it activates the immune system and it can also attack cancer cells. If there's too much, people get really bad reactions and you have to stop the therapy. So it's a balance. 
Now, I don't know uh, if you can see this. This is meant to represent the, the, the um, delivery of, of a nanoparticle in the bloodstream and just um, some of the things that we, we need to consider, like the, you know, in terms of the stability. Uh, you've got macrophages, which are um, white blood cells that actually can engulf the particles. And so they're, they're detecting them as foreign. They can come and engulf it. And then that particle is not available to reach a tumour cell. So uh, that's, that's a bit of a problem. Um, you can also, the, the uh, liver, uh, kidney and the spleen um, clear out nanoparticles very fast. Again, that's where we have to get the balance between uh, getting them in there. Um, and the particles have to be able to cross the what we call the endothelial layer in the blood vessels. So, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Now, one of the advantages we, we can have with cancer cells is that unlike normal cells, which have got really tight junctions, these are the endothelial cells. So this is the blood vessels just here. So this is the, uh, that's the blood vessel up the top here. And you can see the endothelial cells are very tightly packed. So they don't let anything in. And even when a white blood cell has to squeeze through, it has to sort of like, you know, like, um, send off signals to get a space and it squeezes and then it closes up. But tumour cells have a very disordered blood supply because they actually activate their own blood supply. So what you get is these leaky blood vessels and that's actually an advantage. And it's called the EPR effect or the enhanced permeability and retention effect. So as a result, particles can actually cross uh, into, you know, plus this endothelial layer into the interstitial um, tissue um, and get trapped at tumour sites uh, much more readily, particularly if it's a very vascular tumour. That means it's got a lot of blood vessels. But the, the blood vessels in tumours are very disorganised compared to our normal blood vessels. Um, and then you can still get macrophages coming and you've got the stromal cells, these are supporting structures. But this is actually something we, we can and we do exploit. And it's probably why some of these particles are working so well in, in preclinical uh, studies. Um, and there's, look, there's, there's various uh, strategies. This is, um, if you've got a free drug, it just diffuses, it goes into the tumour, but it doesn't hang around very long. If you've got a nanoparticle, you can get what we call passive drug targeting, so you encapsulate your particle, deliver, and, you know, passive just means it will get where it's going to get. Um, from our experience, when we have a tumour, a lot of the particles tend to trap at the tumour. Well, if we uh, image, um, and, and we do do uh, animal studies, and we'll be showing you some, so I hope no one gets upset seeing uh, anything. There's nothing gory. Um, but we can actually see that in tumours, in mice that don't have tumours, the particles just get excreted. We don't see them accumulating in a particular organ, except maybe the liver for a short period of time. Um, we can add these targeting moieties we talked about. So uh, once the uh, nanoparticles get in, they recognise a surface receptor on the cancer cells. So and the cancer cells can actually endocytose. So they can take them up. They um, form this little channel and they take them into the cells. Um, and and then they they can actually release their contents and act. Um, people also um, because not all tumours have got uh, disordered or a lot of blood vessels. Uh, people have also started targeting the endothelial cells, so these, these blood vessel cells, to make them open up and, and let the particle go through. Um, and then um, on top of that, you can combine some of these with also triggered drug release, which is when they get into the... Um, like what well, basically uh, you can develop these nanoparticles, and we've actually been working with a chemist on some of these, which are pH sensitive. So it means that they actually stay intact um, when they, um, they're in the blood circulation at pH 7, but when they get into a tumour cell, the, envir the tumour cell environment is slightly acidic, so it drops to about 5.5, you know, so, you know, 5.5, 6. So when they get in there, they actually release the drug because they've, they've, they're pH sensitive. So the nice thing there is that with these um, pH sensitive and slow drug release, um, type of particles is you can imagine that you, you're less likely to get uh, long-term side effects um, and side effects from the treatment because it's not being released in the bloodstream. It's waiting till it gets to the tumour site to release it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our work in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And um, I've already mentioned um, how what a difficult disease this is uh, because most patients um, of this disease are actually diagnosed at the advanced stage. That means it's already metastasized and spread. 
And because of that, um, when you do treat, um, they, you know, the, the patients often don't respond. They often can't do surgery, or if they do surgery, there's usually residual tumour in the other lung anyway. So what they do here is they, uh, we, they the doctors usually treat um, with a DNA damaging agent. This is a common chemotherapeutic drug like cisplatinum, carboplatinum, and a tubulin binding agent like paclitaxel that I mentioned earlier. So they're the two drugs that are commonly used. And a certain number of patients also have genetic alteration where there's what we call targeted therapy for that genetic alteration. So those patients that are fortunate to have these genetic alterations, actually there are some very effective targeted therapies. The big problem is that invariably they develop resistance to these therapies and the cancer comes back and then you're in trouble. So the net result is despite all these advances, um, the five-year survival rates are really dismal for this disease and they range between um, 3 and 14%. Um, so it, it's a very nasty uh, disease. So we, we've actually been doing some research um, in uh, non-small cell lung cancer and trying to develop a target therapy because our lab actually identified a particular protein that um, is, is increased in non-small cell lung cancer and those increased levels make the tumour cells highly resistant to therapy. Now, at first we thought, you know, it would just be to one class of therapy, but when we turned it off using gene silencing technology, so I won't go through this since you've learnt a little bit about this already, once we switched off this protein in, in the laboratory and we treated the cells, we realised they became highly sensitive to the chemotherapy. Now, this, this was pretty exciting and, and we did additional studies and, and published the work to show, yes, it definitively is some sort of survival factor and it's abnormal. It's, it's actually a protein that you normally would not find in lung, in lung cells. It's actually a protein that you only find in nerve cells. What it's doing in lung cells, we don't know, but it's, it's a protein you find in nerve cells. So um, what we did is we... Um, we collaborated with a group in the US to use these. Uh, this is a dendroma-based system. Um, and this dendroma-based system has seven lipid side chains. And then it's got 26 binding sites for sRNA. And what you can do is you can actually uh, complex, and it's called INOP for interfering nanoparticle number seven. Um, and it's because it's got seven lipid uh, chains. And when you, you mix it with your gene silencing uh, sRNA, it forms this complex uh, with the INOP and the sRNA and then it can actually enter the cells. So when we make this complex, we can just put it on the cells and the cells will actually take it up. So this, this, actually, this particular particle is also good for us because the size is, is good. So this is just um, the particle alone. So you can see it's, it's very small. It's only about 14 nanometers in size when you don't add sRNA. But yet when you add the sRNA, it's around 180 nanometers. Now, you don't want to go much above 200 nanometers when you're doing sRNA delivery, but this was highly promising. And it had been shown before to um, be able to switch off a cholesterol metabolism uh, protein in the liver, and, but no one had ever used it in tumours before. It only had been shown to um, affect cholesterol metabolism. So we decided that we're actually going to look at this um, this particle and see if we can uh, use it effectively and deliver in an intact animal model the sRNA. So um, the first thing uh, we did was to make sure that our cells, our lung cancer cells, could actually take up the sRNA. And what you can see here is um, in uh, well, purple blue here is the nucleus. Um, the red is just um, just staining of the of the uh, the cell, so you can see the outline of the cell. And these uh, yellow green uh, dots here are the nanoparticles. So it's the nanoparticles with fluorescent sRNA. And these images are, are confocal images, so you can actually see that the particles themselves are not just sitting on the surface of the cell; they're actually inside the cell. Um, so we sort of we need confocal microscopy to actually do this. Um, and it, this sort of microscopy, for those of you who are not aware, allows us to, you know, I'm just, uh, I just imagine this cell is, um, you know, this wide. Um, and when you're imaging for, uh, from above, you can actually start doing slices, a bit like when they do CAT scans, and take multiple 
images at different planes of that cell and then you can make a composite of that image and that's what you're seeing here. And you can get a three-dimensional dimension, rendition of that cell. And the other thing we can do is we can, um, we can show that you, these particles um, by, by flow cytometry, and this is a technique where we can, uh, we've got fluorescent particles. Flow cytometry is a, is a device where um, you get single cells going through past the laser and it can pick up fluorescence. And we can measure fluorescence. And what you can see here by flow cytometry is that when you don't have the nanoparticle and you're just trying to deliver a fluorescent sRNA, we don't pick up any fluorescence. But when we complex it with the sRNA, you can see uh, the increase in the fluorescence intensity. And that's what you can see. You can see the particles here inside the cells, but you can't see them. So you do need these. The sRNA alone cannot get into cells. And you need some sort of delivery agent, some sort of nanoparticle delivery to get into cells. Now, it's easy in the laboratory to do these experiments. This then becomes a bigger challenge when you're talking um, about uh, intact animal models. And we use this uh, lung cancer model, um, a non-small cell lung cancer model, um, and these cells actually express uh, luciferase. And luciferase is, is a fluorescent protein, and when we, we deliver the substrate to the animals, the, uh, the cells can light up if they're, if they're there. And what you can see here is these mice have got um, a lung tumour, um, and this allows us to be able to monitor where the particles are going, are they being effective, um, how are they working. And this model actually replicates the human tumour environment very well because what you can see here is, is some staining, that's a tumour there um, and normal lung. And you can see here, this is our protein of interest and you can see it's very strongly expressed in our, our tumour samples. And this is what we're trying to target. We're trying to switch off this protein to make the tumours much more sensitive to chemotherapy. And, you know, it, it was quite remarkable, and I'm only showing you a little bit of data here, that when we did this work, um, we were trying to guess, well, how much do you think it's going to work? How much knockdown of the gene are we going to get? So we thought, well, if we get 30 40% knockdown, we'll be pretty excited. Well, you know, we ended up getting uh, a lot more than that. Uh, this is actually in vivo delivery. So this is actually giving the mice the nanoparticles uh, via the vein. It has to home these particles home to the tumour. Um, now, the reason they do is because the lung is one of the first organs that these particles are going to bypass, you know, as they're going through the circulation. And because the blood vessels are disordered, we think they're getting trapped at that tumour site um, and then they're being taken up by the cancer cells. Um, and that's why we're seeing these, these decreased levels of the protein of interest. And then importantly, when we treat these mice with chemotherapy, remember, the, so this is the drug resistance gene, um, is when, if you look at this uh, far right, when we give a nanoparticle with the chemotherapy, these mice survive much longer uh, than mice that have um, been given either the, um, the sRNA nanoparticle delivery alone or, or a control sequence as well. So this is very encouraging and as a result of this work, um, we're working with a company at the moment on developing a, a lung cancer therapeutic um, for the clinic and we're hoping that by next year we might be in the phase one clinical trials to deliver some gene silencing technology, different, slightly different to what I've just shown you, but the same principle, um, being able to switch off the cancer causing gene and then sensitise to the chemotherapy. Um, and that'll be very exciting if we get to that um, that point. But like I said right at the beginning, there's, there's all different types of uh, therapeutic particles that um, we could be using, and we're still developing new ones because we we think there's great potential for further development. So one of the problems with the particle I just showed you before, which for passive targeting, is even though we can attach what we call targeting moiety on the outside, it's going to end up being very big because it's already at 180 nanometers, right? Well, now we're working on these ones called star polymers, and these are much smaller. These are only about 30 nanometers. Uh, we can encapsulate sRNA into them, uh, and we know we can deliver them um, to tumor cells. Um, and even in, a, in an animal model, when you deliver the, um, the, these particles with fluorescent sRNA, you can see the sRNA alone, fluorescent sRNA doesn't stay in the tumor, but this red staining here is actually the sRNA in the tumour. 
So it appears that you know we can get delivery. Um, so even though this particle would not be good to circulate in the circulation because it would get excreted too soon, our plans are to put a targeting moiety on it so it could specifically target certain types of tumours. So we're working on neuroblastoma, we're working on pancreatic cancer and we're working on um, lung cancer as well. So that way when it gets larger it will still be within the range that will be suitable for as a therapeutic. So these are the sort of things you know we, we have to work on, we have to adjust we have to adjust the sort of side arms we're putting, the length of those side arms. Again, that all modifies the charge, it modifies the ability. Because what we're trying to do here is, is very complex because not only do these particles have to survive in the circulation, get to a tumour cell, get inside the tumour cell, but then they've got to be released from what we call the endosome. So, so they get encapsulated in this endosome, they have to be released. If they don't get released, the cell will degrade whatever is in there. So it's a very tight time frame of, of what's happening here. So when we get something to work, you can understand why we get so excited because you know we have so many obstacles. But we also showed that the gene, uh, one of the genes we were targeting um, to get a proof of concept worked really well. So I'm going to completely uh, switch gears in the last um, 10 minutes of my uh, presentation or six minutes of my presentation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, diagnostics because nanodiagnostics um, is a huge area as well. So I'll go through some of the devices. So this is sort of where uh, people are thinking the future will be. You know, you, you may have heard that one day we, we won't really have to go to the doctor for every little thing. You know, we'll be able to sort of sit at home and talk to the doctor on a computer monitor. Um, people have, have, and this would be really useful for people who, who live in remote areas as well. And one of the ideas is that we'll be able to develop these devices, um, like these um, nano devices where you can just put a drop of blood or you know some, some urine um, onto, onto one of these devices, plug it into your computer or a device that reads in the computer. The doctor, it would analyse things within a short period of time. The doctor would get the results and will be able to make a diagnosis. Um, now, you know, we're not quite there yet, but this field is moving at such a rapid rate that you can imagine that particularly for people who've got chronic diseases where, you know, they need to be monitored and things like that, that it's probably where it's going to go. And, and the reason for uh, the advances in this technology is, is because um, being able to um, print both electronics um, and surfaces that really at the, at the nano and even the, the femtomol type scale. Um, so you can have on these surfaces, which are really tiny. I mean, you know, like you're talking like, um, you know, one or two millimetres across could do detect all these different genes and, and, um, and proteins depending on, on what device there is. But there's, there's a, the systems actually allow fluid to, to go through and coat the surfaces. And then you have... Uh, specific um, sensors that pick up and probe. So for this case, it's a DNA capture probe. So it's a looking, each of these has got a different sequence on it. So if there's, if there's a particular um, disease gene in that blood, it will pick up that particular sequence. Um, I had, when I was in um, Grenoble just over a week ago uh, in France, I was at the Atomic Energy uh, Commission um, I didn't get to see a nuclear reactor, so that was all right. Um, but what I, they did take me through, which was, um, I, I think, fairly mind-blowing for me, was their um, nanofabrication um, clean rooms. And this is where they actually print these, these uh, surfaces, so they're either for electronic purposes or where they, they, they get smart surfaces. So you, you have an electronic platform, uh, a polymer, and, and biomaterials on the top. Um, and the, the technology, like I said, is advancing at an incredibly rapid rate. Um, and, and already, I think they're, they're talking that um, one of my collaborators was involved in developing a, a glucose sensor, which um, apparently can, you can plug it into an iPhone and, and uh, with a small drop of blood, get a reading on the iPhone and analysis, and it all comes up uh, loaded on the iPhone. So it's, it's moving very, very fast. Um, the other thing is a big area is in imaging. Okay, so I, I mentioned this before about um, uh, both multifunctional nanoparticles, but also imaging nanoparticles as well. So the, there's uh, a group recently um, published some work and th where they 
took an iron, iron loaded nanoparticle and they complexed it with a drug. So it became a, a multi, what we call a multifunctional particle. They used uh, magnetic resonance imaging to, um, to image where the tumours were. And because the blood vessel supply was um, disordered, uh, it actually homed to the tumour sites. You can see it there and there. Uh, although you see some in the other, this is probably uh, near the bladder that you're seeing here. But you can see that when they treated, um, that the contrast went down, which means this tumour was shrinking uh, dramatically. So this is just some of the, the sort of applications. But people are, like I said, um, doing these combined devices for detecting disease, detecting very small amounts of disease. Um, we still have trouble detecting good tissue, like soft tissue damage in, in our bodies. Uh, these type of um, advances with nanotechnology and imaging um, are likely to take us there in the, in the near future. And, you know, but people are even, some groups are also using this personalised nanomedicine approach. So, say you develop a nanomedicine, uh, you want to see if a patient is going to be suitable for that nanomedicine then combining an imaging reagent with the uh, drug delivery so that the, the structure of the nanoparticle is very similar to what you're going to give the patient, uh, you can see whether the um, nanoparticle is home to the tumour. If they do, then this patient, these patients will be good for, to go on for further treatment. If it doesn't, then you don't have to subject those patients to that particular treatment. So it's a way of... of um, I guess, uh, streamlining which patients should get certain types of treatment. So there's groups who are working um, in, in developing nanomedicine and, and imaging agents um, trying to stratify the patients that would be best benefit. And I mentioned um, some of the devices, so these glucose nanosensors. These, these new ones that um, are coming out now are actually a mixture. The old ones used to be very uh, electronic driven. Uh, these and but and you've got a lot of non-specific binding. These newer ones actually are using of um, like the, the electrodes as you expect, polymers, uh, nanoparticles, um, and also uh, enzymes cross-linked to the system as well. So they tend to be a lot more um, a lot more accurate and with lot less non-specific type binding effects. So the patient, you know, you, at least when you're getting a reading, you know what it is. And then the, the final uh, bit, and I'll, I'll wind it up in a minute, is the tissue regeneration. Now this is, uh, we were talking with a couple of guys earlier who injured their knees and I said, you know, by the time they're probably in their 50s and 60s, um, you know, you'd be going in and they're going to be repairing your cartilage and things like that. It's starting to happen to a small extent now, but with 3D printing, um, and we can actually start printing uh, parts to the, to the body, you know. Um, so okay, this, is, this is just a little cartoon, but it's, it's not that far off. And the reason we can do this is because our bodies have stem cells in them. So different organs have got stem cells, um, and the stem cells can be um, well. You know about embryonic stem cells. We won't go there, or, you know. But the but there's also what we call pluripotent stem cells, and these are stem cells in our body that are self-renewing. So you know that they can actually they, they self-renew. They're a very small population. And what we can take advantage of that in combination um, with using things like um, like the the mesenchymal stem cells. Um, you can use uh, matrix to to support networks for these cells, um, and you can actually grow different things. I mean, they've grown parts of jaws, they've, they've uh, grown parts of bones using this technology. We know you can use it also for um, so if someone's got really ruined their cartilage, you can't actually replace cartilage. So you can actually take some, uh, so try and isolate some of these mesenchymal stem cells and grow their, the patient's own cells and differentiate them into cartilage and then try and graft that cartilage on. Uh, that's happening, but it's, I think uh, the technology is getting much, much better. Um, so you can you know, regenerate cartilage. Um, and, and bones, the other thing that um, is going on, but, you know, implanting these things. Um, all of you would know about uh, burns, and, and burns are really horrible, and if you get third-degree burns, uh, virtually you're scarred for life, you're high risk of infection, um, and this is just an example of one of these new graphs, and again, it, it's a, a, polymetric, a polymeric material 
that um, you think of it more like a, a sponge that you can then grow the cells in between and the, and the cells can form this layer. But they're biodegradable materials, so once the cells grow over and your body takes over, they're eventually just going to degrade. Um, you can see this, this child that had very, very nasty burns and then after the treatment um, you know, is, is barely scarred. And then there's the body parts. So this is, this is actually a fairly new, this came out last year. This is actually a 3D imprint. So these are actually, actual, have got cells in there. So, um, like, uh, cartilage cells, etc. And this is actually, uh, a cochlea. So this is actually trying to, uh, make, I guess, the equivalent of a bi the bionic ear, but also replace the ear. So imagine when people have had horrific injuries, like burns, or they've got hearing problems. The idea is that you can combine uh, these type of devices, but you know, more often than not, people would just make uh, a small part. Um, but in the future, you know, I don't think it's it's that far off that you know we'll be printing, um, you know, bits and parts uh, of our body. It won't be able to replace everything, but you know. Um, so if you think that sounds science fictiony, you've still got to go and see this movie. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think what I'm giving you today is, I guess, a bit of food for thought. Just some of the things we've got to think about, you know, in terms of stability, that delivery, availability, but also the enormous applications um, from all this technology. So I hope I've stimulated your uh, interest in this area. And uh, this is the motto of our nanomedicine centre. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you.